I can't see how Israeli society uh, will continue to uh, thrive and be uh, have any semblance of uh, uh, of psychological safety, psychological security after this. Uh, you know. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, a member of ICAD USA and Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ, both co-sponsors of today's interview. During these dire days, we're grateful to spend a little time with our dear friend and colleague, partner in the struggle, Philip Farah, uh, born and raised in Jerusalem and among others from the Palestine Christian Alliance for Peace. Philip, uh, you've been very busy. Thank you for taking your time to be with us during these uh, horrific days. Uh, Philip, uh, a few days ago, one of your cousins, uh, Ilham Farah, was killed in Gaza. And there's also Dr. Suleiman Tarazi from the family uh, uh, of our friend G.J. Tarazi, killed in the bombing of St. Porphyrius Church in Gaza. Tell us about your family members in Gaza. Yes, uh, my immediate family, uh, well, my grandpa and my father and all his family, uh, direct family, uh, left uh, Gaza in 1917. Um, so I grew up in Jerusalem, but uh, the Farah family in uh, uh, Gaza is, was uh, a very large presence there, a large Christian family, uh, along with the Jashans, who are my maternal uh, grandma's family. Uh, and the Tarazis are actually very close relatives, almost like the same family, and Sayas and several others. Um, and, you know, our history in, in, in Gaza goes back a very long time. Um, one connection uh, uh, is that my great uncle, uh, with the unlikely name of Alexander Knezevich, my my grand uh, my great grandfather was Croat who settled in Gaza and became uh, you know um, had many children. So the Knezeviches became a large um, uh, multilingual family in Gaza, um, and uh, my great uncle donated the building and the land. Um, of his family, part of it, to the Christian Missionary Society uh, for a clinic. And that later uh, was taken over by um, the Episcopalians and also with the help of the United Church of Christ became the Ahli uh, Baptist Hospital, um, still funded uh, primarily by the Anglicans, uh, the Anglican Union and uh, the uh, United Church of Christ. And that, as you probably know, most of you, uh, was bombed um, and over uh, almost 500, maybe upwards of that, people were killed in that bombing. Uh, of course, Israel lied and said that it was uh, a misfired jihad rocket which was responsible for the uh, for that uh, horrific uh, murder, but um, the hospital had actually um, received um, a warning that it was going to be bombed uh, unless the people evacuated. And you know, as is the case with all the other hospitals, evacuate to where and what part of Gaza is safe. Uh, what part has not been uh, subject to uh, hor horrific massacres. Um, so um, the, the Anglican uh, sponsors of Al Ahli Hospital, of course, uh, you know, refuted that story. Uh, and um, of course, um, our president said uh, that the Israeli um, 
story was a correct one. And, um, you know, as he and uh, others in the U.S. government have validated, uh, um, have have kind of val validated uh, all the lies that are coming out of Israel and, of course, um, at times retracting them later um, because there was no evidence and there was evidence also the contrary. As we can see now, all the hospitals are being bombed. Um, Al Shifa Hospital is being uh, bombed, uh, uh, and snipers have killed people inside the hospital. Um, this is uh, absolutely uh, incredible. So I have other uh, uh, connections in Gaza. Um, yeah, Tarazi, uh, Doctor Tarazi, a prominent uh, dentist. He, uh, his house was bombed. He survived. Uh, walked out of the rubble went to St. Prophyrius Church, which is a church where all my uncles and aunts were uh, baptized and had their weddings, etc. And he didn't survive that killing. And Ilham was actually sheltering in the other uh, major uh, uh, place where Christians have sheltered, the uh, Catholic uh, Church of the Holy Cross. She walked out to go check on her house and take a shower. Uh, she was shot in the leg, uh, was bleeding for uh, 24 hours or something, and uh, they could not help her because they would be shot at as well, and she bled to death. There are so many stories uh, that you uh, um, could share, I'm sure, Philip. Uh, let, let, let's go back to talk about the context uh, because the context is important, right? I mean, you don't have to be a Hamas apologist to understand that, you know, we all know, right, this was not unprovoked. Uh, this didn't come out of nowhere. And I want you to talk a little bit, you know, these young Palestinian fighters who entered Israel and killed Israeli on October, Israelis on October 7th. I'm thinking of them growing up under occupation from babies, right, under under a brutal inhumane Israeli blockade, rationing of calories, poisoning of fields and water supplies, shooting unarmed nonviolent protests during the march or return, and more and more and more, just growing up in that kind of environment uh, and how they were, in a sense, created, traumatized by the occupation. And then uh, um, we're surprised. We're surprised by an attack like this. Right. Well, you know, first of all, uh, you know, the atrocities, uh, quote unquote, that Hamas uh, committed, um, I'm sure there were some acts of, uh, un, you know, un, I mean, unjustified violence against Israeli civilians. Um, but uh, the um, stories that we heard uh, were greatly, greatly exaggerated and made up like the story of uh, children beheaded, uh, babies beheaded. Um, Biden again uh, repeated that story and the White House later had to retract it, retract it saying that there was no evidence. Um, clearly, many of the Israeli civilians uh, were killed by the Israeli Defense Forces, which was in a state of utter panic, utter surprise, and they just, you know, shelled indiscriminately and uh, to um, counter the Hamas attack and uh, killed uh, uh, many civ is Israeli Jewish civilians. Um, but, you know, uh, exactly as you said, I mean, uh, imagine the children um, today growing up uh, and seeing, ha having experienced this horrific massacre, you know, themselves mutilated, uh, themselves uh, having lost a mother or father or sibling right in front of their eyes or are living with a family member who has been traumatized. If any, there are, as you know, entire families that have been completely wiped off the map. Yeah. Uh, you know, as you know, probably um, parents have taken to writing the, uh, on their children's legs uh, in magic markers uh, the uh, names of their children in case they get. So these are going to be 
totally traumatized uh, children. Um, and it's, it's not the first time in history that, you know, when you are subjected to horrific violence, you know, when you are an oppressed people and um, you are subject to far, far greater violence than you can return to the oppressor. I mean, throughout history, uh, in all situations of settler colonialism, uh, the oppressed have often retaliated with violence, sometimes severe violence, but it has always been minuscule compared to the violence that has been visited uh, upon them. And, uh, you know, look what happened in Cambodia after we bombed the hell out of Cambodia. You know, we destroyed that uh, uh, country. Uh, we got the Khmer Rouge, you know, an extremist group that uh, uh, committed uh, massacres even against its own people. You know, uh, when you foment violence, you know, violence uh, gets out of control. And um, um, look at, uh, in, in India even, you know, where Gandhi, uh, you know, is the shining light thank God, of, of a uh, nonviolent uh, political path to emancipation. Even there, there were, um, as a reaction to the extreme violence of the Brits, there were acts of violence by, uh, you know, uh, Indians who, uh, in 1857, uh, there was a massacre of uh, English people by actually members of the army that uh, that were were loyal to the Brits, uh, who were used against their people, but you know something triggered them, and they committed a massacre against the English. So, you know, it is like Gandhi said, you know, a, a um, eye for an eye leaves us all blind. But it is always, always the violence of the oppressor that is far, far greater than the violence of the oppressed. Philip, so one of the things I've been emphasizing in the half a dozen talks I've given since, uh, you know, in the last 40 days uh, is the the role of the media and uh, what I've been calling the war on truth. Um, I mean, this, for example, you'll see the Chirons at the bottom of the page, war on Hamas. But really, this is, this is a, it's a war on Gaza. It's a war on the truth. But it's really on, I've been saying, the war on the Palestinian people, the war on Palestinian culture. And it's it's a war on just the idea of Palestine itself that can't be tolerated anymore, you know, in Israel. So talk a little bit about um, the role of, of the media. Uh, not only, uh, for example, two parts. Let's, let's do this in two parts. Number one, Israel's been targeting for, for quite a while now Palestinian journalists. I mean, Shireen Abu Akleh was the most famous, but really, mm -hmm. what, 20, 30, 40 since October the 7th and, and even before then. So targeting of journalists. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, the, the, the criminality, I would call it, but the complicity of the Western media uh, as stenographers for the Israeli propaganda machine. Absolutely. I mean, you know, again, it's not the first time in history that, uh, you know, horrific uh, genocidal uh, violence is uh, visited upon an oppressed, uh, largely defenseless population under the nose of uh, the, the, uh, the whole world. Uh, I mean, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto happened uh, under the noses of everybody, uh, but it was a situation where, you know, the allies couldn't really do very much about it. Although, I mean, I don't know, but, uh, and and the, the, the Germans, uh, the Nazis, uh, after a month of resistance by the heroic people of uh, the ghetto, they just burned the whole place down. Tell uh, Zatar in Lebanon in 1970s, Three, I think, um, was a siege that continued for several months. And it was very, very uh, clearly covered, covered by all the media in the world. People saw 
what the Israeli, uh, I mean, the fascist Lebanese forces, the Falange, uh, fashioned after the Mussolini's black shirts, what they were with support of Israel, with Israeli uh, army people in their command center, the massacre they committed against the refugees uh, in Tel Zatar, the Palestinian refugees. The uh, American embassy knew exactly what was happening. The media was covering it. People were yeah. showing, uh, and still, you know, they they justified what was happening and saying, "Oh, it's 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 a uh, murder, uh, it's a uh, it's attack against terrorists." And clearly, you know, uh, 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 the thousands of people were being killed or maimed or um, just traumatized, as you uh, described. Uh, so this is what's happening. I mean, um, you know, I frankly get. Uh, extremely distraught uh, to when I'm listening to uh, PBS NewsHour uh, or um, CNN even, uh, although there has been slightly better coverage, but I, I hardly uh, can, you know, stomach uh, listening to, to these outlets. And, and the bias is just amazing. You know, they, they mentioned that... Uh, let's say yesterday or day before the number was 37 journalists um, died. Journalists died. Journalists were not killed. And the identity of these journalists, uh, predominantly Palestinian, is not mentioned. This is just a small example. They yeah. know. <laughs> they know that the majority uh, were Palestinian. Uh, and they know that they did not just die, that they were murdered. And uh, uh, Dahdouh, um, a, a great uh, journalist with Al Jazeera, really gentle, awesome man who goes out of his way, you know, to describe things objectively, as objectively as he sees them. Uh, he got warnings that he's going to be hurt and his family is going to be hurt. And indeed, they uh, killed uh, his uh, wife and and children, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how many members of his family. Uh, so it's it's just horrendous the bias. Yeah. What does it take? You know, does it take uh, actual gassing of the Palestinians in order for for the West uh, Western mainstream media to 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 call this what it is a genocidal war of ethnic cleansing? You know, continuing on with this idea of the media, you know, Israel and their acolytes in the U.S. government and the corporate owned media keep saying that uh, they want to, quote, destroy Hamas. But Hamas is more than a political party. And it's more than just an organization. It's it's a resistance movement. So no matter what you call it, Palestinian resistance to occupation, to settler colonialism to ethnic cleansing resistance is going to continue no matter what you call it right so absolutely uh, say a word about that yeah i mean uh, again you know history shows us uh, like uh, you know um history shows us that uh, the oppressed are never never going to submit and they are going to submission is not an option uh, you know i always uh, i i frankly think that uh, the uh, MLK's letter from a uh, Birmingham jail ought to be added to the New Testament as 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 a book in the scriptures. Um, and he says that very clearly, you know, submission is not an option. Either, you know, you deal uh, with uh, people fa fairly and uh, support their nonviolent resistance or the other option that is left is uh, violent resistance. You see, uh, you know, situations historically where um, the uh, nonviolent uh, uh, strand of resistance got strong international support and became prevalent as in India. You see other situations like Algeria, where, you know, uh, the Western support for uh, the Algerian liberation movement was uh, uh, was not as strong, and it ended up in far bloodier uh, conditions. And you know, so I gave the example of Cambodia, 
the Khmer Rouge, well, you know, there's also the example of India where nonviolent uh, resistance, although it was not the only form of resistance in India, people, you know, uh, forget that historically there was also a lot of violent resistance uh, by some Indians. But fortunately, uh, 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 Gandhi's uh, path was the dominant one that succeeded, partly because of international support. And this is why our role is so important. You know, after, uh, look, this happened after, uh, in Gaza, after the pogroms in Hawara, and uh, the attacks, daily attacks uh, in, uh, on, on all kinds of uh, villages and uh, uh, communities in Palestine uh, and uh, provocations of uh, Muslims in the uh, Dome of the Rock. It didn't come out of nowhere. And it is not a surprise that, uh, uh, but it is a war against the people of, of uh, Gaza. Uh, it's not a war against Hamas. Hamas, uh, all that's going to happen is, I mean, can is there any logic that behind the uh, assumption that uh, after all of this violence, uh, the Palestinians are not going to react? The best, uh, uh, the best uh, way to to reduce the uh, threat of uh, such a reaction being violent is for us to, to uh, support the nonviolent resistance among Palestinians. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, rightly so. Our, um, and I'm going to get to the questions that uh, people are posting in the chat room in just a second, but uh, our attention is rightly turned to Gaza, Philip, but in the West Bank too, there are settler attacks, targeted killings, villages depopulated, and, and more. Uh, we interviewed last week Diana Butu, uh, the terrific Palestinian Canadian lawyer, uh, former spokesperson for the Palestinian Authority. She was supposed to be here uh, a week and a half ago in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and she felt like she couldn't leave for lots of reasons. But one, she she talked about mass transfer, hmm. population transfer. Well, we know that's a euphemism, right? Uh, for ethnic cleansing. So uh, the media wants us to believe these are random acts in the West Bank, uh, but in truth, it's part of the 75-year ongoing Nakba, uh, uh, just like the mass transfer that's taking place in Gaza right now. So talk to us about what's happening also in the in the West Bank. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, uh, the new historians of Israel, uh, foremost uh, among uh, historians anywhere, have clearly and very meticulously do documented how the uh, Zionist leadership uh, had intentions of uh, 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 ethnically cleansing the Palestinians. You know, that was a necessity because had there not been an ethnic cleansing, uh, Israel uh, would have, you know, the state that uh, uh, became Israel, uh, I mean, the the part of the country that became Israel would have had a Palestinian majority. So, um, you know, how could you have a Jewish state uh, uh, with a majority of Palestinian Arabs? Um, and, uh, you know, um, Benny Morris, uh, the leading uh, new Jewish, uh, new Israeli historian, uh, uh, you know, documented how Ben Gurion uh, gave clear orders of ethnic cleansing, and then you know, amazingly, Benny Morris in an interview um, with uh, Akiva Aldar said, um, and he, by the way, considers himself a leftist um, in the Israeli. Uh, political uh, uh, spectrum. And uh, he said, um, you know, um, uh, this would have been a much quieter place, quieter place had Ben Gorion gone all the way. Uh, it would have been wow. a much better uh, situation. And anybody who's interested, I can send you the uh, the, and, and Smotrich has been uh, going around saying, you know that the Palestinians really have three options. To he 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 is he's quoted as saying, uh, "We will fill the West Bank with settlements." Um, 
the Palestinians have uh, three options, either to submit or leave or die. And this really was, you know, kind of part of the story leading to October 7, because uh, the Israeli army uh, uh, pulled a lot of divisions from the south because they weren't so worried about Hamas uh, to take them to uh, the West Bank where the settlers were conducting pogroms and um, with the help of uh, active help of the Israeli army, uh, basically to, you know, uh, to talk to to uh, bring about ethnic cleansing. And, uh, and, you know, according to Smotrich's, and, and that's really was part of uh, what the, the events leading to October 7, you know, the Hamas saw an opportunity because the border in the south was far less uh, secure and entered. And um, uh, because, you know, of course, Palestinians were outraged by what was happening in the West Bank on a daily basis. I have a number more questions, but let's get to the questions from the chat room now, and I'll just take them in order. Uh, your good friend Linda Kerr is asking uh, about our friend in the White House, right? Joe Biden, self-declared Zionist, um, who's given Israel the green light to do whatever it wants to do. She asks, is it your feeling that the Biden administration knowingly and willfully lies? Oh, I, I have no doubt about it. Um, I mean, and there's a history there also. <laughs> Remember Iraq um, and, um, you know, about the weapons of mass destruction and, uh, and, and we destroyed a country uh, totally and got ISIS, by the way as a side effect uh so um right th there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that uh, there's a history there and that uh, it, it it's continuing i mean there's an obsession with military solutions that absolutely do nothing but create more um uh you know bloody conflicts and uh, uh, situations as we are witnessing now in gaza and who in the right mind expects that that is a solution to the security of Jews in Israel. Now, you know, uh, I remember a few days, one of the um, uh, relatives of uh, a hostage is uh, saying that, uh, you know, what, you know, what is the justification anymore for our presence here? We are supposed to be a safe haven for Jews and, you know, that's not going to be the case after this, as you know, as it hasn't been the case after, you know, the confiscation of land and all the things that created rage among Palestinians in the past and and caused escalations of violence. But but there's no doubt that there's lying. Um, uh, you know, now Israel uh, Israeli forces are in Ahli Hospital, uh, claiming that. Um, uh, the headquarters of Hamas is underground there, yeah. and and the Israel and the U.S. government uh, uh, says uh, validates that story as well. Philip, I've got a number of questions here, so if you can be succinct and yeah. uh, uh, sorry, uh, okay. yeah, no, 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 this is wonderful. I just want you to know that there's a lot of interest uh, among the folks gathered, and we want to be respectful of your time as well. So let's go to the next one. Um, what kind of two-state solution do you recommend? Is it possible in light of many Israeli establ uh, settlements established in the West Bank and East Jerusalem? Who should be in charge of Gaza? Yeah. Well, I mean, the people of Gaza ought to be um, the ones to decide the fate of Gaza and uh, how they want to live and how they ought to be governed. Um, unfortunately, I think that Israel has created so many settlements, which really, you know, is, uh, and, and I spoke earlier about the pogroms uh, that are a result of um, this uh, bid to take over more land. Um, so they created so many settlements that uh, a Traditional two-state solution is, I think, out of the question, and I think more and more people are seeing that. Uh, I think that, you know, at some point, uh, you know, 
there ought to be one one state with equal rights for everybody. Now, there probably has to be some kind of transition. I don't know. It has to be a creative um, uh, kind of arrangement, maybe uh, cantons along, uh, you know, some model like Swiss model of cantons and uh, leading, you know, leading up to a situation where there's one country with uh, equal rights for everybody. Um this next question is one that I was going to ask you. And so uh, can you comment on the 30 infants in incubators that Israeli soldiers cut off power and, uh, and cause their death? Has any similar case occurred in recent history? Did it happen in World War II in Germany? And I'll just add to that uh, the horrific, right, uh, 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 news that uh, where uh, last week the, this group called... Doctors for the Rights of IDF Soldiers urged the bombing of hospitals yeah. in Gaza as, quote, a legitimate target for annihilation. And they gave the typical Israeli refrain, you know, with crocodile tears coming down their cheeks. See what they made us do to them. Yeah. Right. So so with... say a word about the, uh, the, the, uh, the babies in the incubators who passed away in the in the hospital. Huh. I mean, it's horrific, right? I mean, I don't know if, if we even have words to, to talk about it. Yeah, uh, were you referring to doctors, uh, uh, Israeli doctors saying it's okay to bomb? Yes. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, and uh, over, over 100 doctors signed this. Uh, uh, well, and that was preceded by a similar uh, uh, statement from rabbis, uh, from yeah. Israeli rabbis. Uh, you know, the question I mean, is about these babies, though. Right, right, right. I mean, uh, so I, I don't know about any uh, uh, examples in history before that. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, you, you saw with, I'm sure, I, I hope that the American public who follows this has seen seen this with their own eyes, uh, how uh, they were removed from incubators that were no longer working. Uh, because there's no diesel to run the generators. Electricity, of course, uh, has been cut off uh, for quite some time, but fuel uh, is uh, needed for the generators, and those have stopped for incubators, for dialysis machines, for respirators. So all, all of these people are dying, and very, very, very painful death for deaths. You know, the other day, a doctor described the death that happens when you can no longer have dialysis. Uh, it's an extremely painful death. Um, uh, you know, every time I drink a drop of water, I, I, I think of this. Um, every time I go to the toilet, I think of people, uh, you know, uh, like 60,000 people sharing three toilets. Uh, every time I wash, I think of how, you know, families take their children to the to the Mediterranean Sea, if they are close enough uh, to wash uh, wash them in water that has been contaminated to no end because uh, there's no electricity for sewage uh, uh, cleanup, uh, and and because you know, uh, and even then they are under the bombs, uh, and and there have been attacks on them when they are doing that. It's I mean, imagine every activity that I do during my the course of the day, I get these images of having no electricity, no water, you know, no food. Um, it's, you know, horrendous. The next question is, uh, there's, we, we know about the media bias, we know about entrenched politicians. Where have you seen evidence from the churches and other religious organizations challenging the lies and reframing the narrative? Oh, uh, I mean, I think uh, that many of our allies in the churches, as you, uh, as some of your uh, audience knows, I'm with the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, and um, we have close alliances with uh, uh, Palestine Israel networks of uh, the different mainstream denominations, and um, and we really highly appreciate uh, the statements that have come out from our allies in the churches condemning this uh, 
uh, uh, continuum of massacres. Um, unfortunately, the church uh, leadership has not as been forthcoming. Uh, in fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think a, a statement came out of the presiding bishop, the Anglican presiding bishop, uh, overflowing with sympathy. Well deserved sympathy for the uh, civilians who were killed uh, in uh, Israel, uh, in the south of Israel. Uh, but uh, the the language vis a vis the Palestinians was far far less uh, sensitive. You know, we are concerned. You know, uh, yeah. rather than, uh, and um, uh, you know, tremendous uh, condemnation of uh, Hamas and. Uh, hardly any, um, uh, you know, just again, you know, words like we are concerned uh, about uh, the uh, retaliation from the Israeli side. Um, this double, uh, fortunately, later, the uh, bishop uh, of uh, the uh, 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 Episcopal Diocese in Washington came up with a much more, you know, um, reasonable statement. Um, I think calling for a ceasefire, uh, which the presiding bishop, uh, by the way, did not call for. Yeah. Uh, so we really need to put more pressure on our church leaders. Say a word, would you, about the um, say a word about this uh, recent lawsuit against Biden, Blinken, and Austin for supporting and enabling genocide against uh, the people of Gaza. I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, the, the Center for Constitutional Rights has filed a lawsuit oh, yeah. uh, against mm -hmm. Biden, Blinken, and uh, Secretary Austin uh, mm -hmm. supporting and enabling genocide against uh, the people of Gaza. So comment on that. Absolutely. I mean, um, um, you know, while the U.S. public is beginning to wake up and 66%, I think, according to the latest uh, poll, are for a ceasefire, uh, the administration is, uh, you know, making some very, very feeble uh, noises calling for a humanitarian pause. You know, what is a humanitarian about a few hours where, um, you know, uh, any fighting stops and then your, cho yeah, your choice is uh, to either leave or die. Is that humanitarian? Um, you you have, you know, a few hours of cessation of the bombing, uh, and your choices are to leave or die. You know, according to the Smotrich for formula that I uh, mentioned earlier, um, they know exactly that what's happening, uh, and probably better than you and I. Uh, but uh, uh, they they are really enabling it and encouraging it and. Uh, uh, sending more and more weapons to uh, support it. Um, and that's not only uh, the U.S. leadership. Uh, it's also true of, of all people, the Germans, the German leadership. My God, I mean, what does it take again? Does it take like gas chambers for the, for, for the Western leaders to wake up? Uh, it is, you know, unmentionable. I mean, unspeakable. There's a question about, uh, could you comment on uh, Israel's 1956 war uh, where they teamed up with France and Britain to control Gaza for about a half a year? Uh, President Eisenhower's reaction was quite different than Biden's. Uh, I don't know much about this. Can you comment on that? Yes, I mean, you know, uh, you know that uh, in order for Israel to uh, come into existence, the uh, Zionist leaders knew very well that they have to align themselves with the colonial powers. Uh, so, it, you know, um, they were aligned with the uh, British and the French who were, uh, uh, you know, the colonial powers in the Middle East uh, who were bombing uh, any kind of uh, uh, national movement uh, for emancipation in Iraq, in Algeria, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Palestine. Uh, some of the first uh, aerial bombing 
bombings of civilians in history were conducted by the French and the British. And um, uh, they were the sponsors of the uh, Zionist project. And so when Nasser uh, became a prominent uh, leader calling for uh, uh, Arab control of the resources like the uh, Suez Canal, uh, that was a big threat to the French and uh, the Brits. And so they teamed up with Israel to attack uh, Egypt in 1956. Um, uh, in 1967, a very similar story. The U.S., uh, you know, really was worried about the threat uh, posed by leaders like Jamal Abdel Nasser um, uh, to our oil in Saudi yeah. Arabia, and 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 so that's the history. And um, uh, I think the calculus uh, behind Eisenhower's uh, pressure on the uh, French and uh, the British and Israel uh, to uh, stop their aggression against Egypt and for Israel to withdraw from uh, the Sinai was <laughs> cynical because they wanted to replace, uh, 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 Eisenhower wanted the US to replace uh, 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 France and Britain as the leading uh, you know, power in the Middle East. Uh, but we know the aftermath was, uh, uh, you know, um, extreme support for Israel, no matter what. We have another uh, good question here. We we mentioned about, uh, obviously, the Palestinians inside Gaza. We've talked about the Palestinians in the West Bank. Talk to us a little bit about what's happening with uh, Palestinians who live inside of Israel. Yes, as uh, uh, probably many of you know, that uh, the Palestinians uh, uh, inside of Israel are subject to a at least 50 laws uh, that discriminate against them uh, in favor of, uh, you know, Jewish. Uh, and sometimes it's more subtle than a law. Uh, 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 I mean, you know, a lot, the, the Palestinian ownership of land in what became Israel was over 96%. And so the land of uh, Palestinian uh, villages that remained in in Israel uh, was confiscated by all kinds of means. And uh, Israelis have privilege if they serve in the army, uh, all kinds of uh, services. If you look at, uh, uh, yeah, and, and the Palestinians, because they don't, the Palestinians in Israel proper, 48, uh, do not uh, have uh, these privileges because they did not serve in the army. So there are all kinds of subtle ways. I could go on forever to tell you stories of uh, even relatives, you know, who, uh, you know, who were, uh, whose property was taken over in Haifa. My family, uh, our property was taken uh, in 48, my mother's uh, house in the, uh, in West Jerusalem. But uh, people who stayed in, in Israel suffered uh, similar fates. Uh, uh, they were pauperized uh, with all the, their properties uh, handed over to the uh, new uh, immigrants from Poland and elsewhere. Um, so, uh, and there's extreme repression uh, against them. Uh, and they have reacted with uh, protests uh, where, you know, I mean, in 76, uh, a number 12, I think, I don't remember the exact number, were killed uh, uh, in a protest uh, called later commemorated as Land Day. Uh, and there have been, you know, there, there was a massacre in 1956 in Kufur Qasim, uh, massacre of Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel. Say a word uh, uh, about the uh, the kibbutzim that were attacked. If you if you know, uh, there's a question here about the Jews who who are located in the on uh, inside of Israel, but on uh, kind of on the Israel side of the border with Gaza. That these were sort of the uh, Jews, dark dark skinned Jews, and others who are uh, um, uh, um, yeah. Who who are uh, uh, there's prejudice against them within Israeli society. They're not Ashkenazim, so right. uh, the racism among Jews, just among Jews within Israel. Yeah. 
Well, you know, uh, uh, this is oversimplifying, but there are two kinds of uh, settlements that are, um, you know, on the border. One is exactly the kind that you mentioned, uh, where it's it's a long story. Uh, they they but I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, in 1948 uh, and let's say up to 1951, uh, Jews from Arab countries were uh, uh, you know resettled in uh, uh, in. Palestinian villages uh, often that were destroyed and turned into Jewish settlements. And somewhere along the, first of all, they were placed in Ma'berot. Ma'berot were um, temporary uh, tent cities uh, uh, for new immigrants. And they put them in the most dangerous places often uh, uh, along the border, just like you said. And later they became um, uh, uh, settlements uh, along uh, the border uh, and um, de they call them developmental cities. Mm -hmm. uh, their standard of living and their services, etc., are way below uh, the average for certainly uh, less than uh, the... The other kind is the Nahalot uh, and uh, uh, Kibbutzim usually have very, very few, well, historically, uh, Mizrahi Jews, meaning uh, Jews with darker skin. Uh, they are kind of more the ideological vanguard uh, and, you know, military elite. Um, uh, many uh, of the pilots of the Israeli Air Force come from uh, these uh, 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 kibbutzim. Um, but, you know, I mean, the discrimination... Uh, the, I'll give you an example. Uh, the Iraqi uh, Jews were among the most educated and um, uh, many of them were uh, professionals who were very successful in Iraq. Uh, and when they came to, to uh, Palestine, well, what became Israel, they were uh, sprayed with DDT, uh, you know, uh, because they were viewed as dirty uh, people compared to, and and they complained that they were put in tents while Romanian Jews uh, were uh, uh, settled in uh, nice nicer, you know, real buildings. And uh, when asked about that, they were told, "Well, you are from the desert, you know, you uh, you are used to uh, this kind of weather, and uh, the European." Uh, Jews are not. Uh, I mean, these are very well documented uh, uh, discrimination uh, examples from Israeli sources. Let me ask you this. Uh, there's the bigger question in the, the question that's asked by our friend Esther here. Um, why Gaza? What's 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 so why is Gaza so strategic? Why, why do why do the Israelis want Gaza? And Esther's question is, does Israel's desire to build a canal? I've heard there are oil field, you know, there's oil uh, right off. Yes. But now it, Esther asked, does Israel's desire to build a canal have anything to do with their desire to get the Palestinians out of Gaza? So those two questions. Well, I mean, I think it's more complicated. Yeah, there are natural gas reserves. Um, gas reserves, okay. Yeah, and maybe oil. I, I don't know about oil, but definitely natural gas reserves. Um, but I think, you know, um, I mean, Gaza is one of the most uh, densely populated uh, places on Earth. And uh, uh, so uh, the, because there are, you know, so many uh, refugees expelled uh, from um, Palestine, uh, who went to Gaza uh, in, into such a small territory, um, it has always been difficult for Israel to control uh, Gaza because, you know, it kind of lends itself to uh, guerrilla warfare. So that's when, that's why Israel, um, I don't remember exactly when, <laughs> uh, decided to evacuate Gaza because they just could not control it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, so they... Um, well, they couldn't control it from the inside. Uh, so basically, it's like a prison, you know, um, 
uh, like a prison, you know, uh, the prisoners uh, control very little of uh, the uh, of their lives. Um, you know, uh, they um, are uh, the you know they they have the land, uh, but they uh, are you know you know how Israel uh, sends only enough uh, calories uh, for the allow allows only enough calories to prevent starvation. Well, not anymore. Now they are starving, uh, Gaza. Uh, but that was the policy before. And um, uh, so, you know, um, they, 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 they control it from the outside in very horrific ways. Uh, they control the electricity, they control all forms of life. And, and the Gazans, of course, are going to resist. And uh, and so that I think is the main reason why Gaza is so uh, such a target for Israeli uh, um, terrorism, basically, and massacres. Now there have been uh, many, many Jewish groups that have stood with Palestine, Jewish Voice for Peace, not in our name. It strikes me that, especially here in the U.S but also around the world, Jewish support is very important. Say a word about Jewish support. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, support from all demographics in the West is extremely important. Israel is a very racist society. It really does not see itself as part of the Middle East. It sees itself as an extension of the only uh, demographic that counts for Israelis, which is uh, Euro people of European stock, white people of European stock. And so, um, as in the case of apartheid South Africa, you know the the whites in South Africa did not see themselves really as a you know as Africans. They saw themselves as an extension of uh, uh, colonial Europe, and any so any uh, opposition to the apartheid regime, uh, whether in South Africa or Israel, is really has has huge uh, moral and psychological impacts. Because of that racism, now uh, and 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 so that's why we, all of us here in the U.S., are so important uh, to to a peaceful uh, and just resolution of the conflict. Because if we tell them, "Hey, not in our name," uh, that that is a psychological uh, blow to Israeli society and to to this uh, apartheid. Uh, a project, uh, but of course, you know, when it's uh, young American Jews, that is, is at least as powerful. You know, uh, the people whom we are supposed to represent, all Jews in the world. Of course, that's a false premise. You know, when they are not buying our mythology anymore, uh, that is a double uh, psychological blow to Israeli uh, apartheid. It's extremely important. I, I mean, just I, just think just think about that. I mean, Jewish Voice for Peace group, along with Students for Justice in Palestine. What was it? Columbia University just a couple of days ago. They were banned. Jewish Voice for yeah. Peace was banned yeah. on campus, along with SJP. I mean, it's. I mean, yeah. the world is upside down, right? Uh, uh, I mean, what uh, what uh, Jewish groups have done is amazing. I tell you. Uh, I attended the protest of uh, led by, if not now, uh, group uh, uh, at the White House where they uh, conducted uh, civil disobedience. I, I was in tears uh, at seeing um, hundreds of uh, Jews, um, you know, telling Israel not in our name and blocking the entrances to the White House. And of course, what followed in Congress was even bigger. There were more arrests. I think 200 people got arrested. And at uh, uh, Grand Central Station, I mean, you know, how how could young Jews buy it anymore when, you know, when they saw Hagee yesterday at the demonstration, you know, uh, praising the most right-wing agenda uh, there is. I mean, these are people who are homophobes, who are 
actually anti-Semitic, like Hege, you know, I'm yeah. sure most of your audience know, he believes that, um, you know, uh, uh, that uh, uh, there will be Armageddon and, um, uh, and that's why he supports Israel, because uh, Israel, uh, according to some scripture, supposedly uh, will have this Armageddon and uh, those who uh, side with Israel will, uh, uh, you know, will be uh, saved. Uh, but the Jews and the Muslims will not be saved if they don't convert. I mean, how? What? What young man and or young woman uh, uh, will will buy this? Uh, uh, you you have to be totally brainwashed, and I, uh, that's I'm, not the case. There are so many young Jews who are not buying it. I'm glad you brought up the the pro-Israel march for Washington yesterday. But as you pointed out earlier, hundreds and hundreds of thousands into the millions. Uh, I'm going to just name a few. In London, Jakarta, Istanbul, New York, Washington, D.C. Uh, and there are you know, scores of others. We're doing our part here every Tuesday with our protest Tuesday rallies. Change isn't going to come from the top down, right? I mean, we have to, we the people, have to force our leaders to understand uh, and to make them do the right thing. Uh, so say another word. I know you said it before, but about the importance of our activism on the ground. Right, exactly. I mean, um, again, you know, uh, I think the example of South Africa, there are differences, no doubt, uh, is very telling. You know, um, even India, even other places uh, where... Um, uh, external uh, solidarity with the oppressed plays an extremely important role. Um, and the case of South Africa is similar in this regard that, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, whites in South Africa really, uh, you know, did not expect uh, that um, the movement against apartheid would be so strong. You know, they uh, most likely thought, oh, you know, our brethren and sisters in the West are making a few noises here and there, but it's not going to be a big deal because they know that we have to kind of hold the fort of civilization, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in South Africa. But when they saw, uh, when popular pressure um, forced uh, the Thatcherites and Reagan um, to uh, to uh, take real measures against apartheid. I think the apartheid regime in South Africa collapsed uh, psychologically more than economically, and certainly not militarily. Um, so I think uh, the same is true for uh, in the long run. That's why our role is so important. And it's important because, again, I know I mentioned this, uh, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. You know, the submission is not an option. It's either peaceful resistance like the BDS movement or violent resistance, as we saw in October 7. And the more we give hope to the nonviolent resistance movement in Palestine to BDS and the like, the better the chance that uh, uh, there will be less violence uh, in in the future towards what is inevitable that you know Palestinians will uh, get their rights. I I am so uh, confident of that, but we play a huge role in reducing the threat that it's going to be bloody. Uh, like like the case was in in Algeria. Well, we see the bloodiness now, but you know, the more we do, the 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 better we give a chance for a real just peace. You know, you mentioned the South African example. Uh, Reverend Edwin Arison, Anglican priest from South Africa, close friend of Desmond Tutu, closely connected with Rifat Cassis in Kairos, Palestine. He and I just led a trip to South Africa uh, in September in the footsteps of Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. And Palestine was a was a large piece of that uh, of our experience there connecting apartheid South Africa with apartheid Israel and the anti-apartheid movements in each one. 
we spoke with uh, 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 Alan Bosak and John DeGrucci and others, and we visited the Desmond Tutu Legacy Museum and uh, went to Robben Island, and that we're and we're doing this again in May, and so it just is kind of an unashamed commercial. If anybody is interested for in information about that, please get in touch with me. But this connection between South Africa model, while there are differences, but but there's a close relationship. And just this joint statement that the Cairo South Africa published with Kairos Palestine was very important. Uh, l let me ask you one last question, and I'm going to give you a time to to add whatever you'd like to do in closing, Philip. We keep hearing that everything has changed now, you know, after October the 7th and what Israel's doing. So the first step that we must be about is a ceasefire. Uh, where do we go from there? I mean, a ceasefire, I mean, it's still on the horizon somewhere. So that has to be our focus. But where do we go after the ceasefire? Yeah, um absolutely ceasefire um first step uh, but uh you know i i've already kind of talked a little bit about this um it, it has to be a you know actions and a program uh that is more in line with the uh, with the um uh slogan that uh, uh jvp and other progressive jews if not now Jewish organizations have raised, not in our name. And that has to include boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And as your audience probably knows, uh, many uh, denominations, Christian denominations, have uh, indeed passed resolutions uh, uh, calling for divestment uh, of uh, funds, like pension funds of churches from companies that profit from the occupation like Caterpillar and Hewlett Packard and um, G4, uh, G, is it G4 or G, G4 uh, that runs prisons uh, all over the world, including uh, in Palestine and in the US. Um, so uh, boycott, divestment and sanctions has to be part of the story. Uh, the American Friends Service Committee is leading a wonderful uh, project uh, uh, called um, uh, Apartheid Free Communities. It started out as Apartheid Free Churches, and now um, they changed it to Apartheid Free Communities. And many, many churches and other houses of worships and other communities have uh, signed on. Um, uh, yes, and, uh, you know, the cultural boycott as well. Um, uh, sports boycotts have played such a huge role uh, historically uh, it, we really have to follow the uh, a program of not in our name uh, to to uh, encourage uh, peace forces not only in Palestine but also in Israel itself encourage people like Gideon Levy and uh, Elan Pape and uh, uh, and you know bring about um, internal change and internal pressure. I, I, you know, I really, maybe, maybe I, I don't want to dwell on this question too long, but uh, maybe I can say something about that uh, as well when you give me the chance. <laughs> Good, because uh, I do want to give you the final word, Philip. Uh, but before I do, I want to say thanks to UCC, Palestine Israel Network, and ICAD USA for co-sponsoring this webinar. Uh, check out our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace Facebook, Facebook page and website, and Philip, your closing thoughts. Yeah, in a way, I'm kind of repeating myself to some extent. I really, uh, I I can't see how Israeli society uh, will continue to uh, thrive and be, uh, have any semblance of, uh, uh, of psychological safety, psychological security after this. Uh, you know, um, unless there is a movement uh, here, especially in the U.S., again, you know, it's a matter of racism. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. is uh, 
the only place that really, really counts in the imagination of many Israelis. And if we um, tell Israel in no uncertain terms that uh, this is wrong, um, there, uh, and, and if there isn't real change in Israel from a mindset where they see that the might of Israel and the destruction of the Palestinians is the only route, um, I, I can't see how Israeli society can continue to be kind of psychologically viable. So even if you care about, you know, I mean, hopefully you care about the well-being, not only of Palestinians, but also of Israeli Jews, uh, you ought to really uh, push that message. Uh, you know, if if your friend is drunk, then the right thing for you to do is to take away the keys. And, um, um, you know, Israeli society was already beginning uh, to experience extreme um, divisions well before uh, October 7. There, there was the movement uh, against the so-called uh, reform of the judiciary, which the um, extreme right-wing government of Israel was uh, pushing. Uh, but now after this, there's going to, in my opinion, be even more uh, divisions in Israeli society when the dust settles. And the only way that uh, uh, Israeli society will experience a modicum of, uh, uh, in, of sanity is if we uh, make it clear to them that they have to live in peace with their neighborhoods with uh, real justice. Um, a full justice is never going to be achieved in uh, for for my people, you know, for my family, for for the all the people that we have lost, for all the land we have lost, for all the attacks on our culture and our um, very being. Um, but uh, there has to be justice, and and the only way we can reach uh, real peace uh, is for us to. Uh, tell Israel in no uncertain terms that there has to be accountability and they have to uh, uh, follow a peaceful path that that's the military uh, destruction of another people uh, is not an option. Philip, uh, we still remember your time with us here in, in, in Indiana very fondly. You have many, many friends here. Uh, thank you. I, I'm speaking on behalf of all those gathered now. Uh, thank you for your time today. Blessings to you. I know you're very busy speaking. Wherever you get invitations, we thank you for your time with us today. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, and please, you know, wherever you are, uh, invite us to your churches. I mean, certainly the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, uh, we are, um, you know, we have people across the country uh, who can speak at your churches, speak uh, at your mosques, and uh, and not only uh, uh, Palestinian Christians, uh, uh, I have very close friends who are from Gaza, um, other than Christians, who are who would really appreciate a chance to um, to connect with you and um, you know provide you with insights about what's happening to Gaza and to Palestine. So please uh, do keep us in mind. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you.